Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Park Avenue Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Hour, where the pastor, Ellie Campbell, is the pastor of this outstanding congregation. We're looking at uh, the sixth chapter of the book of Acts this morning, uh, and the Sunday School lesson is called, titled, Faithful Versus Faithless, When the World is Against Us. Background scripture is coming from the 6th chapter of the book of Acts. The print passages are going to be Acts chapter 7 through 15. And we'll uh, take a look real quick at the uh, lesson aims. Uh, let's see, as a result of experience this lesson, you should be able to do the following. Consider ways Stephen was strengthened when faced with false accusations about persecution, false accusations and persecutions. Acknowledge ways that the love of Christ and the Holy Spirit encourage and strengthens our faith and bear witness to personal faith and trust in Christ in the face of threat and danger. Uh, I just want to kind of just take a look at this sixth chapter. And there's some things that uh, stood out to me uh, as we uh, take a look at this chapter and I, I kind of just kind of like to talk about those for a little bit. But anyway, anyway, in the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, of course, there's a problem. There's a problem that, uh, that uh, is going on in the church where the, let me get to the, uh, let me get to the first verse, first or second verse of it. Here we go. Now at this time, while the di disciples were increasing in number on a complaint, arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews, the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. The church at this particular time uh, is consisting of, it's, it's consists primarily of Jews, but you got two types of Jews going on. You got two types of Jews in the church. You have the Hellenistic Jews, the Hellenistic Jews are those who are under the influence of the Greeks. They are Greek-speaking Jews. Uh, this is why you find in the uh, New Testament that uh, a lot of people have two names. They have their Greek Hellenistic name, uh, and they have their Hebrew name. Paul was his Greek name, and Saul was his Hebrew name. That's, uh, and of course, uh, Paul is going to cater more to the Gentiles, in his ministry, but what it speaks to, it speaks to the impact that Alexander the Great had on the world when he conquered the world at, at, at that particular time. They called it, they call it the Hellenization of the world. Hellenis Hellenization means the influence of Greek culture on the world at that time. Yeah. The influence of the Greeks was so profound that many of us still have Greek names. My, my, name, my name is Gregory Stephen. Both of those are Greek names. <laughs> Both of those originate from Greek. The Greek influence on the world was so profound, it still impacts the world today. If you go to the gym, the gym was bought to you by the Greeks. It was called the gymnasium. And so if you go to the gym, that was brought to you by the Greeks. If you go to the theater, the theater was brought to you by the Greeks. And so the, the impact and the influence that the Greeks had on the world, especially at that time, was profound, and so much so that they influenced the Hebrews in the fact that most of them were speaking Greek now. And uh, the Hellenistic Jews, that, they, they probably did not speak either Aramaic or Hebrew. Amen. And so they had their own separate synagogue, so to speak, but they were, in fact, Jews. They were, in fact, Jews. And so you have these Hebraic Jews, or how did the uh, New American Standard Bible classify them? It classified them as against the native Hebrews. And this is another distinction that needs to be made. Number one, let me just talk about the Hebraic Jews. These are the Jews to whom the book of Hebrews was written to. All right, all right. Because they, they really were steep in the Jewish tradition, so on and so forth. Uh, so much so that they would not take uh, Greek names. They would not take Greek names. They would not do anything that was uh, uh, common uh, to those who were influenced greatly by the Greeks. And the, 
the, uh, the book that characterizes and captures um, uh, the Greek culture in that particular time was written by a man named Philo. Philo is where we go to find out the mindset, if you will, of the Hellenistic, uh, of the Hellenistic Jew. And so, uh, uh, in thinking about uh, the impact that they had, and so, the other thing about the Hellenistic Jews, well, they, were, they lived outside of the land. They lived outside of Jerusalem. And so, uh, this, there was just not, not a whole lot of animosity, but certainly some animosity between the, uh, the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews, and we see that as a part of the issue or part of the problem that uh, plaguing uh, the church at that particular time. So they set apart seven men, and what's interesting about the seven men that they set apart is, number one, the qualifications. Let me just get down there real quick. Therefore, select, uh, therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, and this is what needs to stand out. They're full of the spirit and wisdom who will be put in charge of this task to serve the tables. And it's interesting that they call them serving the tables because, as we see, Philip's both Philip and Stephen's ministry are, is, will even go beyond that, go beyond the, the, the point of serving tables in as much as they are going to be uh, outstanding evangelists, outstanding proclam proclaimers, if you will, of the word of God. And so in the sixth chapter of Acts, we are introduced to Stephen and the six men set apart to address the controversy between the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews who served as a target audience, and I've already said that, served as a target audience uh, for the book of Hebrews. All right, let's take a look then. We're in the Sunday school lesson. We're taking a look at uh, Brother Washington as he comes in. That's my homeboy from East St. Louis. So I got to give Brother Washington his props. <laughs> East St. Louis is in the house. <laughs> Now all I got to do is get Brother Wright to walk through the door, and the Marine Corps will be in the house. <laughs> all right. Uh, do we have any extra Sunday school books by any chance? And if not, no worries. We got we got Bibles anyway. I, I'd rather use a Bible anyway. I don't think so. Okay, here we are taking a look at verse number seven. Verse number seven uh, in the text. In the text, uh, and I'm going to read it from the. Uh, I'm reading from the King James text. Everybody with me? Let's read it from the King James text. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Why do you think that the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem? Why do you think that was the case? Okay. Yeah, and the people were receiving it. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's an increase, increase right there. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? I should have went to the mic, huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you should have, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you should have went to the mic. You should have went to the mic. Yeah, man, you know, hey, you know what's up, man. It's yeah, uh, brother teacher, I, th I think uh, something else to keep in mind is not only were, uh, um, not only did it increase, first, first of all, they didn't have the, um, what's the word I'm searching for? Anyway, senior moments gone, came, went. But, but they, the reason why for the increase was because the apostles were free to teach. Yeah. The, the, uh, and pray, uh, the people uh, embraced uh, the message. Uh, uh, it, it, made, it made sense to them. We don't know how many eyewitnesses of the resurrection mm -hmm. uh, were there at that time. But I think once you had the deacons in place mm -hmm. who, could, who could take uh, the, the apostles' attention away mm -hmm. from their main job, uh, uh, you had an increase there. And, and, and just people reaching out and embracing 
uh, what they'd learned to the extent that the priests were even uh, yeah, uh, right, convinced. Right, right. And, and that's the point I was trying to get at. The gospel was able to increase because the apostles could preach the word without distraction. And that's the thing about the church. And this is one of the things, you know, I've been, I've, I've been gone for what? Uh, sheesh. I, I came to the church in what, uh, 1993, I think it was? 92. I came here in 92. Yeah, I, I, I came here in 92. And I, as a matter of fact, because I was a new member in 92, and because uh, you know they put new members to work well, when they come here, and so they made me the MC for the 77th church anniversary, okay? For the 77th church anniversary. And, of course, you know, I've, shortly thereafter, you know, I've been in and out over the last 30 years. But it's amazing to me how the ministry has kept going on and the ministry has kept going on in part because Pastor Campbell is able to focus on preaching the, preaching the gospel, preaching the word, but it speaks to those under him, those addressing, if you will, the administrative affairs of the church. Those addressing, you know, it's one thing that, that, that gets me is how faithful, if you will, and I don't mean to call names, but I'm just going to call them anyway, John DeBose. Major Carter, how faithful they are to the prayer ministry, how faithful David is. This is why sometimes I feel kind of like I'm shortchanging David if I'm not using his notes. Why? Because he puts so much into it. So the faithfulness of the people who are serving, who do not get any attention or any recognition for the role they play. All right, Greg. This church could not be where it is if it did not have the deacons, if it did not have the church officials, the church officers, and taking care of the administrative aspects of the church so that the message of the gospel could constantly, consistently be preached. I said it Wednesday night. I said it Wednesday night, and I'll say it again today. It's amazing to me that every time Pastor Campbell gets up to preach, every time he gets up to teach, he's a constant reminder of why he is the pastor. There is nobody like him. And the time and the commitment that he puts into preaching the word is what brings us all here. This is why I don't like teaching on Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> I don't like teaching on Wednesday because I come here for the same reason y'all come here. I come to hear the pastor. Okay. I come to hear the pastor to preach. I come to hear the pastor teach. And I know that myself, Brother Lonnie, none of us can hold a candle to what Pastor does. All right. And he, he's got to, maybe, maybe, maybe the bishop. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I, I wasn't talking about you, Chris. Why are you over there shaking? I'm talking about, I'm, I'm talking about Trey. <laughs> But it's interesting to me, it's interesting to me uh, how God equipped the church. And I think this is going to be brought out. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I, uh, 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 why do you think, why do you think, and I'm still in verse number seven. Go for it. You know the question? I'm a, there's, a, there's a true prophetess. <laughs> a true prophet. What's the question but, I'm going to ask? Well, you know, if, if we go back to where you started at. Uh -huh. You started at verse six, uh, chapter six, verse one. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you go back to that, those verses when the church was having problems, the Hellenistics having problems with the with the Hebrews, and they selected those deacons mm -hmm. so that the apostle says that we can be free to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. That to me is why, and you get to verse seven, there was an increase. Mm -hmm. Because of that situation exactly. that happened in the first six verses. Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, now stay right there. Here comes my next question. <laughs> Amen. Why do you think a great company of priests were obedient to the faith? Why do I think the priest was, was being brought into the faith? Mm -hmm. Let me think for a minute. Well, the priests, they were all on, they were all on the Pentateuch. They was all teaching the Pentateuch. Right. Just, just mm -hmm. like Apollos, you know, he knew the first five books. He, knew, he didn't know the gospel mm -hmm. when he ran to Paul. 
Same thing with the priests. Until the gospel was preached and they received it. Mm -hmm. And probably, like doctor said a while ago, uh, 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 Smith said, there's probably some of those priests right there at, at the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, one guy, uh, one guy uh, that, I, that, that, that I listened to, uh, his name is S. Lewis Johnson, he had an interesting perspective. Because, and, and, and he's right, all you can do is speculate. All you can do is speculate, but yeah, all you can do is speculate. But but his perspective, and I, I thought it was interesting, because of leprosy. Okay. Ooh. Leprosy. <laughs> he said, never. And this, and I, th I believe this to be true. Uh, I didn't. I didn't go back to. Uh, I didn't go back to check. Mm -hmm. But you know, if a person was cured from leprosy, there was a, there was a some things he had, some steps he had to go through in the law. Yeah. And they had to go to the priest. Yeah, to be declared and to be declared. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, during this time, there were so many people being cured of leprosy <laughs> that the priest had to get, the priest was sitting back saying, what's up with this? <laughs> now, I'm putting that, of course, in my own vernacular. But... Uh, and it, but they they were able to see people being healed and people being and especially of leprosy and things like that that it caused them to recognize yeah. that right. that yes he was indeed the and, and other sicknesses and lame. Um, other sicknesses being lame and what have you and so that was a that was a profound testimony yeah. to those who were actually a part of the temple go ahead there uh, and uh, and, David. And, and and this is speculation too but. Uh, to see the fulfilling, I believe, mm -hmm. the priests that believed mm -hmm. saw the fulfillment mm -hmm. of uh, uh, what had been prophesied. Mm -hmm. But I, I think, to your point, I think the miracles of seeing people healed yeah. was was a was facilitated because mm -hmm. facilitated the priest's belief. Right. Yep. Yep. In in uh, in the prophets, and, and and of course we know we know that some of the Pharisees believed, even some of those sitting on the Sanhedrin council. I mean, right. you, you had to be you, you had to be blind not to see some of the things that were happening and occurring right there in the church at that time. Mm -hmm. Everybody still with me? Because I need you to be with me on this uh, point. Okay, uh, go. Day you got to go to the mic. <laughs> In the book of Acts, in that second chapter, after the church was born, it said, and the apostles were doing miracles. Remember, Peter and John went to the gate of beauty. They were doing miracles. So the priest had to be had yeah. to be evidence or witness to what was going on, yep. other than just the leprosy. Okay? Yeah. Now, we got two questions. Or we got, we're going to spend some time on verse number eight. All right, chime in, because this, 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 this is, I want, to, I want you to see this, I want you to see this both in the King James text and I want you to see it in the NIV. Notice the distinction between, uh, the difference between the two verses. All right, everybody there? Mm -hmm. So it says, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Yeah. Okay, now notice in the King James text, it says he's full of faith and power, but notice in the NIV, now Stephen, a man full of grace and power, performed wonders and signs among the people. Now, I've taken a look at both, both Greek manuscripts, uh, and when I say both Greek manuscripts, I've looked at it in the Texas Receptus. The Texas Receptus is the, is the manuscript that underlines the King James Version. Everybody there? It underlines the King James Version. The Texas Receptus does in, does in fact say full of faith. All right? The Texas Receptus does say full of faith. The, the Greek text underlying the NIV, the Greek text underlining the NASB, the Greek text underlining all of the newer translations does in fact use, say, grace. Okay? 
<laughs> it says, now Stephen, a man full of grace and power, my question to you is what's the difference? What's the difference between being full of grace or full of faith? What is the writer of the text trying to capture? That word grace means that uh, he, he was operating under the power of God's uh, anointing. Uh, he had the grace of God to stand up before a, a hostile crowd to proclaim the gospel message. Okay. Because he had a mixed, he had a mixed, uh, mixed multitude of people in, in, in his uh, congregation. So he had to be operating under the grace of God. And he was a faithful, he, he was talking about their history in a faithful manner. He was talking about some of the things that he had did up until that point. So, so what Stephen did was rehearse their history in a faithful manner. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, being overbearing uh, as far as his uh, way he was communicating to the people, but he was operating under the power of God, man. Okay. God was using him mildly to speak uh, a clear message to the people. Okay. And, he, and he, he received some hostility. He had, he had some hostile, hostile people in this crowd. They gnashed their teeth at him. My brother Dave brought up a little bit yesterday, uh, Wednesday mm -hmm. how they was gnashing at him because uh, anytime you speak the truth about somebody, uh, they're going to they gonna have their toes stepped on, right? Okay. Somebody's going to get upset when you talk the truth, Greg. And uh, that's what Stephen was doing, man. He was just putting them on blast, letting them know, hey, man, you all got some, you know, you got some baggage. All right. But he was coming with the real, though. Thank you, sir. Anybody Thank else? You. Thank you. There you go. I think the question on your question is, what comes first? Hmm. What comes first? Does, does uh, 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 faith come, come first, or does grace come first? I mean, uh, if, if, if you see in verse 8, yeah. in the King James Version, it says he was full of faith and power. And in the NIV, it says he was full of grace and power. You know, grace is God's unmerited favor. Okay. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Well, you got two of us monopolizing stuff. Oh, uh, no, you got, uh, I, this, 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 I throw this out waiting. there. I'm just holding up for Dwight. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm waiting for the bishop to speak. Yeah. Oh, the bishop already spoke. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So in, in the NIV, we have grace, God's merited fa unmerited favor. And then in the King James, we have full of faith and, and power. So to me, both... Uh, 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 are an indication of the power of the Holy Spirit. They are both, yeah. But Stephen was chosen in the beginning because he demonstrated, like the other six, men who had, you know, the, the, the wisdom of God, who were full of faith, who believed in God. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's it. I don't know. Oh, it's, 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 I mean, there's, yeah. number one, there's certainly no wrong answers. Here, let me give you guys this. You got one. I gave him one. Oh, okay, good, good. Uh -huh. Here, let me give it this, this too. Yeah. 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 You got one of those? We, yeah. Can I, can I speak for a minute while, while they're doing it? Uh, not just yet. <laughs> I, I, I want them to know where we are. We're oh, looking at, uh, eight. if you're looking in the Sunday, I'm sorry. Your name? Let me, let me just get your name. Amen. How you doing, George? How you doing, Angela? Here's the issue at hand, what we're talking about. If you look at that Sunday school book, we're looking at verse 8. Yeah, we're looking at verse 8. In the King James Version, it says Stephen was full of faith and power. In the New International Version, it says Stephen was a man full of grace and power. And I'm trying to see if we can get the distinction between why one says grace and one says faith. Did I, did I, did I misquote it? You said full of grace and power. Grace and power. Yeah. God's grace. Full of God's grace and power, okay. Mm -hmm. 
and the other one is full of faith and power. Thank you, mm -hmm. potentate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Has the potentate. We got some names for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, Lonnie, let's yeah. go, brother. Now, you, you were asking that, that question about faith and grace. Yeah, well, and grace. why, and, and, and the question I'm trying to figure out is, why is one translation differing from the other? What was it the author trying to, to me, convey? It seems to me, and this is me reading. Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah. It seems like they're substantially the same. It's saying that uh, 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 the meaning, uh, because to live in faith is to walk in grace. Okay. Okay. I'm done. That's it? All right, done. Oh, man. He's, he's coming. He even took his sunglasses off now, so he's ready. <laughs> yeah. Amen. You got anything, Dwight? No, I'm just listening. Now, what, I, now what I've already indicated, now, both, both words are in the Greek text. Yeah. In the, once again, in the Texas Receptus, that's the text that underlies the Greek text. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the text that underlies the King James Version. The word is actually faith. But in the text that underlies the newer translations, the word is actually God's grace. It is actually in there. And so here's what I wrote in my notes. And, and everything that's been said is fine. Everything is said is fine. Full of faith stressed the intensity of his belief in the risen Savior. Stressed the intensity of his belief in the risen Savior. Full of grace stresses the intensity of the favor undergirding his ministry. Because Jesus or, or Stephen is going to bring forth a profound ministry yes, even in the short time in which he lived. Yeah. And then both of which are manifested, both of which manifested itself in the power present in his ministry. Because now, bear, and wait a minute, I got a note here somewhere. Okay, hold on a second, hold on a second. I, want, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Great, so while you're looking for your note, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it true that, uh, uh, like Paul, for example, I use him as, I like, I, I like to use Paul as an example of uh, having a personal encounter with uh, Jesus Christ. You think that's what gave them their, uh, their boldness to proclaim? Yes, I think so. They had it's, a personal encounter? Now, if you, like I say, when we, if you have a personal encounter with Jesus, you're going to change now, how you communicate. Hold on. Let me interrupt Go you ahead. just for a second. Go let, ahead. Me, let me just interrupt you first because I'm setting you guys up. Okay. <laughs> you are being set up. <laughs> okay. I'm You're listening. being set up. I'm setting you up. Say again. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So go ahead, Trey. No, that, that's, that's, that's what I get, man. I, I get, these men had a personal encounter. Okay. With, the Jesus, with, the Lord, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, man. Now, so, I want you to remember you said that. Yeah, and, uh, you know, just like everybody that's in this class right here, everybody had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. That's what brings us to church because we love the Word of God, man. And so these men had a personal encounter with Jesus. Jesus manifests himself to these men, like Paul on the road to Damascus. He, he, he dealt with Paul. He said, hey, man, why are you persecuting my people, man? What's up? All right. Okay? All so right. So that's, that's how Jesus, Jesus gets us off our, off our normal program. Okay. He said, hey, man, I got something better for you. That's how he got with me. He said, I got something better for you, man. And All going right. Drinking them 40 ounces and carrying on. It, <laughs> going to the nightclub. Come I got on, something Trey. better for you. We know you got a 40 ounce in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. The apostles laid hands on them. Yes. They, 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 they were not, they didn't write names, but they laid hands on them. They called yeah. the apostles back to lay hands on them. Yes. Yeah. But, and the, what was up, the, the, and, and, okay, everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. The apostles laid hands on them, but they were chosen by the congregation. Exactly. Yes, sir. Exactly. Uh, they were chosen by the congregation. <laughs> They were chosen, and you said this earlier, they were chosen by those qualifications set before the congregation. Exactly. They didn't say go find somebody we're going to uh, uh, teach. They were already full of the Spirit. Okay. Full of the Spirit. They are okay. already doing things that qualified them for that position. All right, bro. Thank you, sir. That's good. That's 
I, my, my, the, the main note I got, I, it, it's coming after the next verse, but I want to just go ahead and read the note I got here. Faith, wisdom, grace, power, and above all, the presence of the Holy Spirit were the personal qualities that equipped uh, him for the ultimate witness he would soon bear. Because he is going to quote, if, if, if you want to know what the Bible is all about, read chapter 7 of the book of Acts. Why? He covers all of it. He covers all of the, the it, it, it's as if he covers the totality of the Old Testament in chapter 7, all by himself. And I'm sitting there wondering myself as I'm reading all this, how did he learn all of this? How did he learn all of this? But he says, faith, wisdom, grace, power, and above all, the presence of the Spirit were personal qualities that equipped him for the ultimate witness that he would soon bear. The Spirit and power are closely linked and led him to perform signs and wonders among the people. As such, the legitimacy of his call to ministry was validated by those great works and wonders and signs he performed. But not only that, he was able to defend when challenged by the opposition. Let's read verses, uh, I want to say verses 9 and 10. We can read those from uh, the King James. Let's read that together. Rose, certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and of those of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke, which he spake. All right. So here we are, and again, we've already talked about there's there's going to be two types of uh, two types of synagogues. Once again, they are Jewish synagogues, but again, you got the disparity that exists between the Hellenistic Jews. Those are your Greek-speaking Jews. They don't, they, they, they don't speak, uh, they don't speak uh, Hebrew. They may not speak Aramaic. I, they, uh, yeah, they may not speak Aramaic. And so they got their own separate synagogues, but they are, in fact, Jews. These are Jews, again, that are highly influenced by the Greek culture, just like we are highly influenced by the Greek culture. Like I say, some of us are walking around here with Greek names. Okay? <laughs> and like I say, if you go to the gym, it's because you've been influenced by the Greek culture. If you go to the theater, it's because you've been influenced by Greek culture. Alexander the Great, there's a reason they call him great. Because he did conquer the known world at that time. And even after his death, we are still under the influence of the Greek culture by the fact that the Greek, the, the, uh, the Greek dominance was maintained by his four generals. Everybody there? Yeah. And it's a, it's, there's a reason. Uh, uh, we talked about this in seminary. There's a reason why God set that up. Because the Greek language is one of the most expressive languages that there are. The Greek language is profound. I like the Hebrew, too. You know, the Hebrew language asks the question, Hebrew language asks, asks the question, can you see what I'm saying? Because Hebrew is going to paint a picture for you. Okay? Hebrew is going to paint a picture for you. Uh, and it's asking the question, can you see what I'm saying? That's why Hebrew is so expressive. But Greek, on the other hand, Greek, on the other hand, you know, English is a time-based language. Okay. We had we talk past, present, and future. Talk when you know, did it happen? When when English is a language that's more concerned about time. Mm -hmm. Greek, on the other hand, is not so much concerned with when something happens as opposed to how something happens. Yeah. And this is why we spend so much time talking about the Greek voice. This is why we talk so much about the Greek. Uh, the Greek mood, uh, whether it's in the indicative mood or what, what have you, because Greek is concerned with how something happens. And so it's a most expressive language, and the Lord prepared the world for Jesus Christ by introducing the Greek language. And this is why our, our New Testament, our New Testament is written in Koine Greek. But in any case, so the persecution arises, and so these that you see, Thank you for looking at the clock. <laughs> when it says, and this was something I didn't realize, that you might, might even have it in your notes, Dave. Then arose 
some from the synagogues of the freedmen, the Caesarians, the Alexanders, and those of and those from Sicilia and Asia, well, guess where Paul was from? Cilicia. Paul was from Cilicia, and there's a, there's a thinking that Paul was probably a member of one of those, one of those synagogues, as a, and probably in, in, in the um, Hellenistic ones. He was that free. Yeah, cause he, and that's why he was there. Yep. And that, that kind of, yeah, yeah. that, that point is easily missed. It's easily missed. But here's the question, though, because i got to get to my question. Now he is tasked with defending his ministry against those who are set apart to minister. He confronts the Greek-speaking Jews that make up the synagogues of the freedmen. Now watch. As Peter defended his ministry before the Hebraic Jews, Stephen takes up his case to the Hellenistic Jews, to the Hellenistic Greek-speaking Jews, and in so doing, he ends up confronted with the same fate as Jesus and the apostles. He is faced with defending himself before the Sanhedrin council, but he does it under the wisdom, power, and anointing of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Stephen's powerful testimony would be the climax of the church's witness to the Jews, and then the message is going to go out from the Jews to the Samaritans and the Gentiles. Where is my question? Here, there it is right there. So my question is, in the church today, why is it so hard to find men like this? Full of the spirit, full of the power of the Holy Spirit of living. Because this is one thing we cannot say. We cannot say that these things ceased with the coming of the New Testament. Because, you know, they say a lot of gifts, a lot of gifts played out with the with the complete revelation of the New Testament as we know it now. So the question is, where are these men today? Where are the men full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit? Why do we not see this in our churches today? <clears throat> well, you can say that again. Too many distractions. Too many distractions. You know what the one, number one distraction is in the church today? Money. Money. Yeah, meant money. And God already said in his word, you cannot serve both. And you got those who are chasing the dollar and telling everybody that they want to uh, I mean, they're telling everybody, everybody what they want to hear, tickling ear. Now, you got to remember, you got to remember, you got to remember that the church today is how old? Over 2,000. About 2,000 years old, yeah. right? Yeah. How, how old was the seven churches in Asia that Paul addressed in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ? How old were those churches? Young. Very young. Yeah. Not even 100 years old. 60 or 70. If God found fault, we're talking seven churches. If God found fault with five of the seven churches in the first 100 years of the church, here we are now 2,000 years removed, and nobody's reading what God found. Nobody's reading the fault of the first seven churches, yeah. I, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you the problem with the church. But I'm going to tell, tell you what Brother Summers told me. Because it was profound. You got to be careful with Brother Summers. He'll come off with something that's profound. He, and, and, but I'm going to tell you what, exactly what he said. He said the problem with the church today, we're serving good food on dirty dishes. <laughs> okay, okay. Good food on dirty dishes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. here he comes. <laughs> we just struck a nerve. <laughs> uh, no. I, I think uh, a couple of things. Uh, the, the statement full of grace uh, and power, <clears throat> I think that was introducing what came next, those who were against him and how he, with grace and power, with the dunamis power, the power of God in action, and uh -huh. how he did it, right? And he spoke it in grace. So okay. I think that was the introduction to 
when they were going to come upon him uh -huh. and speak against him. So he wasn't mad at anybody. He wasn't screaming and hollering. Yep. He presented it in the form of grace, but he did it in the power and the action of the power, the deutimous power of God that gave him. What is the problem with the church or why don't we see it? We do not act or we do not demonstrate the power of God that's in us. And I say the devil knows how much power we have. He just mm -hmm. don't want us to know right. how much power we right. have. And so when we demonstrate that in the, the actions of God, <clears throat> and we think it's so much in don't do this, don't do that, if we simply proclaim the word of God with power and conviction. Yes, sir. Right? Power and conviction. And it's the Holy Spirit. The Amen. Holy Spirit Amen. Holy Spirit. Thank you, sir. We finally got you out of your seat. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to verse 11. Go ahead. Go ahead. Testament in the New Testament, Paul to that Paul in his last letter to, to Brother Timothy, his, his farewell letter, he said these days were going to come. These days are here. He, he said, but he, but in that time he said they were coming. He said he says, uh, 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 for time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Paul said that. Yeah. Paul said men become lovers of themselves. Yes. He said yes. that. And I ain't gonna even call names. Okay. I ain't gonna even call names. All right. All right. But he said, watch, die, and all things, he said, though. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he gave them good, good advice. Uh -huh. Yeah. But these days, right, they're here already. They're here. They're here. They're here. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to say this, and I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. We may not have the greatest choir in Riverside County. Uh -huh. We may not have uh, all the programs and the exciting kids program. But what we do have yeah. is a dedicated pastor yeah. who's preaching right. and teaching right. the word of God. God yeah. And, and you, you can't, I don't think you can hold a counter to us when it comes to doctrine. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think so. And I don't think you can hold a counter to, to, to the pastor's preaching. And, and Dave, you were there just back in, this was a long time ago. We were out at Nichols Church. And he said, Pastor Campbell, he's the last of a dying breed. Yeah. Because yeah. he's taking the time to teach the word. I got to get moving. And they were stubborn men, which said, we have heard him. Oh, uh, to, you know, okay, they were. And there was stuff, I can't even see with my glasses on. <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump down to the, uh, I'm going to jump down to the NIV because it, it, it says a little better. So then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard speak Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. What were the blasphemous words that Stephen spoke? Mm -hmm. To you and me, they weren't. To them, they were. He was Pharisee, most of them. Yeah. And they didn't believe in the, 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 the Exactly. Right. And see, they, and here's the thing, and, and this was, was a great commentary. I can't remember which one it was, but I was reading on, uh, on the book of Hebrews. And it said the book of Hebrews is trying to tell a Hebrew not to be a Hebrew. <laughs> you know? And that's, that, that, that don't sit right. Yeah. But the thing that the Hebrews and the Jews have to come to understand Jesus is not putting away the law. He's fulfilling the law. And that is, that, that's the most important aspect of Jesus' ministry. He was born under the law that he might fulfill the law. And so they had to come to the realization that the law, there's nothing wrong with the law, but the law has been fulfilled, every aspect of it. The law has been fulfilled. Let's go to verse 12. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. Yes, they seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. And, of course, we know the Sanhedrin was a joke anyway. Yeah, it consisted man. of both the Sadducees. The yeah. Sadducees were the aristocrats. Yeah. They were the ones who were in line with Herod. But the Pharisees, and uh, I think it was you, Trey, you didn't even, it sucks. That's why you got to watch Trey, because sometimes he'll come up with something profound. Yeah. And well, he I read, did. I, I, read, I read the word for he came up. He came up with something profound last week, and I, everybody might have missed it, but I was there. He read Matthew 23. Yeah, right. He read Matthew 23 where he had their, uh, yeah. uh, what's his name? Dwight. Me and Dwight, you know, we, we are pupils of Dr. Black. <laughs> <laughs> but Dr. Black, one of the things Dr. Black said, he said if Jesus was more closely aligned with any group in in, in in the uh, during that time, he was more closely aligned with the Pharisees, right. 
And, and what did he quote? He quoted Matthew 23. He said, the Pharisees do and say, he says, he said, they sit in the seat of Moses. I, I, I don't yeah, have the so text in front of me, but he said, they sit in the seat of Moses. He says, whatever they say, do, but right. they do and they say and do not do. But he said what they were doing in terms of the law was correct. Their, the, the, their origin, their origin, they came out of the uh, Maccabean revolt. Their origin was, was sound. But now they're starting to stray away. They start, they, they're, they're, they're straying away from the spirit of the law. It's one thing to hold the law, but you have to hold the spirit of the law too. Go ahead, Trey, I'll real quick, because i got to finish up. You, I'll, I'll be brief, but I know you're on a time schedule. You know, you always going to have church detectives spying you out once you start to go against the flow of uh, normal uh, uh, worship. And you start speaking out a cer uh, against a certain practice in the church. Oh, you're going to have some opposition. Oh, you will. Because you got church detectives. I call them church detectives, man. <laughs> they be hiding behind the bush on you. Boy, they be at your house. I see Greg come in at 12 midnight. <laughs> he had liquor on him. All you right. Ain't had, you ain't had no liquor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Go ahead, Greg. Here we go. I'm, I'm finishing up 14 and 15. Uh, up 13. <laughs> they produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stops speaking against the holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. He never said he would do that. Uh, he said he'd, he'd, his, he'd, 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 he didn't change the customs that Moses handed down. He fulfilled the customs that Moses handed down. That's right. All of who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw his face as it was like portlocks. <laughs> yes. Oh, Lord. That's what you get for coming late. That's what you get for coming late, Portlock. You can't catch a break. If you come late, you're going to get picked on. <laughs> <laughs> and they saw his face was like a face of an angel. His face was transfigured right in front of them. Yeah. So that, and this was the validation of his ministry and the validation of everything now he is getting ready to say because he is going to go into that seventh chapter and he is going to lay down the whole history yeah. of uh, the whole history of the Jews and uh, with the culmination of you have killed all of the prophets, and now you have crucified Jesus Christ, who you've hung on a cross, but he rose that third day morning with all power in his hands. Lonnie's going to make me quick because I'm two minutes over. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this time of study. We want to just ask, oh, Lord, that you continue to bless us, watch over us, and protect us. In Jesus' name. We have uh, three guests. Philip is here. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, but I forgot your name just that quick. Gibbons. Gibbons. Gibbons and Angela. Amen. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to the class. <laughs> anybody, uh, anybody lose this notebook? All right. We're done. Thank you, sir. <laughs>